Becca, then she goes to Treehouse Dam. So that's going to be a, a normal route. Oh, sorry. I just don't want to put any lights on her. Chef, <laughs> thanks so much. All right, let's see if we can get it going now. And I'm marking a territory. And, oh, she's seeing something. She's listening out, but we will follow up on her tomorrow morning, straight towards Treehouse Dam. Treehouse Dam, it's going to be. Let's see, maybe she'll be up in one of those marula trees around Treehouse Dam which would be fantastic. I think she just went to go and sniff something on the left there. She's going to come back onto frame. But yeah, thank you so much for all the comments and questions, everybody. Thanks for joining us once again on our sunset safari. What a wonderful day we've had on Catterday Saturday. And uh, what a way to end Catterday Saturday with the Queen of uh, Juma, old Tlalamba. But yes, please make sure that you join us once again tomorrow morning on a beautiful Sunday morning on our Sunrise Safari. And that will be at 6 a.m. Central African time. From the Wild Earth team, from Tlalamba, have a wonderful evening. Good night. Coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on our Sunrise Safari on this stunning Sunday morning. As you can see, the stunning orange colors coming through on the horizon. And the sun has not come up uh, as of yet, but very soon. Good morning, everybody. My name is Cedric, and behind the camera with me on Wendy, we've got the Muscles and Paw and his little Teddy. So, yes, thank you for joining. And I'm hoping that we are going to have an amazing drive this morning. I'm sure we are going to get some amazing sightings as always. But it is a perfect, perfect start to the day with this sun that's slowly but surely going to appear for us in the next maybe five minutes but for now we are just going to sit here and enjoy those beautiful orange colors coming through almost like an like a fanta orange color but i love that but just joining us on our sunrise safari this morning on um, safari we've got amy and uh, panda and then our amazing team there in Johannesburg, our two directors for the morning is going to be Jared and Tadiwa. And our tech guru that side is none other than the Toes. And our tech guru here at Juma is going to be Max, also known as Showmax. But yes, this is a live, this is an interactive show. So if you've got any comments or any questions, suggestions that you want to send through to us and have a chat with us, please go onto our YouTube channel. Make sure that you do subscribe or join our membership and you can send all those comments and questions through. Or if you are watching on the Wild Earth website, make sure that you do register so you can also send those comments and questions through to us. And I'm hoping that we can answer as many questions as possible possible but my plan for this beautiful Sunday morning is I'm gonna slowly head down towards Treehouse Dam that area maybe I know that Tlalamba that beautiful leopardess from last night she was coming south the usual route would have crossed over the big open clearing coming into this area towards Treehouse Dam 
So we are going to go to the head side very shortly. But for now we're just enjoying the stunning sunrise. <laughs> Melody, yes, it's beautiful, peaceful, and very quiet. Got some, some, I don't know, some like a, a lilac-breasted roller that was calling in the background there. Not the prettiest of calls for the morning. You've got that typical <coughs> noise, but it's got a stunning colours. Some black headed orioles as well that <whistles> calling nice morning choruses happening around here. You can hear that one, eh? that bearded woodpecker. Doot, 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 Queenie, yes, thank you for joining us on our sunrise safari and yes, happy Sunday fun day. Boy, are you ready? Do you think? Uh, let's get going, huh? Let's get to Trials Dam. All right, we're going to start heading towards uh, Trials, <coughs> Trials Dam uh, while the morning is still nice and young and fresh. Let's see if we can pick up on uh, Tlalamba. I know that uh, Amy has picked up on some male leopard tracks going south on Zoe's. But yeah, well, we're going to head over to Treehouse Dam. Uh, let's head over to the weather to see exactly what's happening here today. Good morning everyone and welcome to the Sentinel. We are starting off with some beautiful zebra walking right past the vehicle. My name is Amy and together with me today is Panda. There we go. Dream team back together again. Oh, they're walking now just past us to the left hand side is a bit tricky for panda. I'm going to reverse. Hopefully we can have another look at these zebras, everybody. But I hope everyone is well. Everyone's had a good, good time uh, overnight. Good evening or morning or whatever part of the world you are in. Just turning around, we can get them walking. Is that good, panda? there we go and Cedric is correct I did have some male uh, leopard tracks on this road heading south uh, this is a road that runs from north to south and so I'm driving down having a look so far nothing more um, but exciting times lots of potential this morning so we're gonna just explore this western area also follow up in the area that Cedric had those mating leopards yesterday. It is likely that they've moved off, pushed back off west, but it is always good to check. So I'm going to do that. Thanks Darcy Miller. It is good to be here with you all. A new day, a new start. Not sure what we're going to find today seems like really all the sightings that we've had over the last few days have sort of wrapped up in a way. Kills are finished, animals have moved off. Um, so it's almost a little bit of a blank slate for us this morning. So it's exciting. We've got to build up again, search out, look out for, for the animals um, and see what this uh, town holds for us. Yeah, all right. Well, they have carried on up the road. We actually found them walking towards us like that. Um, and then they pushed off around us 
uh, on the side of the road and now they are carrying on. They obviously have an, an idea of where they want to go to those zebras this morning. I love a zebra. So wonderful to see zebra. I didn't see zebra at all on my last stint here a few weeks ago. So very nice to see what were four or five of them walking up the road this morning. All right, Panda, I think we must carry on down the road here. Just have to turn around. Oh, how time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> oh. Wild Earth is turning 17 and we want to make the years count. <laughs> 17 years of achievements, close encounters and special memories. He's got it, he's got it and he's straight up a tree. Come along as we reflect on our top 17 greatest moments. Here's to more years of connecting you to nature. Wild Earth, connecting with nature. All right, so I did pick up on, uh, looks like a uh, typical Tlalamba coming here towards Treehouse Dam, the way she was coming, got a tracks here now at Treehouse Dam and then cut into the block towards this road here now. So I want to see how far, but you know, she can travel very far during the night if she needs to. I just want to see if she hasn't come out on this road now. I think I see something here. No, nothing here there or she's gone directly straight into this block well, she's gone into this block it's gonna be a little bit tough to try and locate her but let's see if we can uh, look around the uh, and all the franklins are going crazy here in the drainage line but not for any predators just a typical morning uh, shouting and morning songs going down that side Oh, Kelly, for sure. It will be nice to see Ihina. It will be very, very nice. But we'll, we'll keep our eyes open. As I said, I want to do, I want to do the, um, oh, well, I want to go to the Hyena Dens on Taxon's Road just to double check on those ones. Oh, this tree's broken. This is like one of Clalamba's favorite trees. Remember we saw a loss? So yeah, this, this tree is broken. This Marula tree. Oh, and she loves this tree seen it like three times up in that street yeah all right 
Mm -hmm. And maybe elephants uh, broke the entire branch off uh, from the top there. Oh. All right, so no tracks coming out here. Last is going there towards the dam, so I've got a feeling she's cut straight into this block. So I might actually go do a little bit of a loop to the southern side, uh, towards uh, the southern side of Juma. Let's just see if she hasn't popped out on that side. If not, then she must be in this block here somewhere. Somewhere. And it's in this, uh, in this uh, area here yeah, is not, uh, not small. It's, it's actually quite a big area, this, and very thick. Nice and fresh this morning. I see I'm pausing and getting another set of layers put on his uh, body there. That's uh, a good idea. Stay warm. Sorry, I did not copy a thing there. No, sorry, Jared. I just heard your voice in the background there, but uh, nothing came through. Ah, <laughs> Agatha Krusty, yes, on a on a leopard a snoop for a Sunday morning. And see, well, as I say, while it's still nice and fresh, try and see what we can pick up on, uh, you know, especially with leopards and lions, hyenas, you know, any of those little nocturnal animals that still will be a little bit around at the time of the morning. It's always nice to see if we can get them and see what they're up to. But for now, for now, for now, I'm just a bit worried that she's already gone south into a little Gari. I haven't got any tracks still to this side. I'm going to go on Gari Main. All right, well, we are going to try and follow up on uh, Tlalambo and to see if we can get lucky with her. I think let's go and take a look at a beautiful clip all about uh, that leopardess. Columba is a leopardess in her prime. She is Queen of Juma, daughter to Tandi and the late Duke Tingana. Her name means mischievous and playful. At Juma, Tlalamba is a tricky customer to keep up with, retaining her playfulness despite her maturity. She is always on the move, much more so than other leopards. Even on the hottest of days, she will frequently move big distances on the hunt or marking her territory.
Salamba is enigmatic, energetic, and extremely confiding. We watch her life unfolding with laughter, tears, and always appreciation. But she's loving it. You can see she's even like cleaning a paw. Oh, she's eating the whole side of the head, so the cheek, the eye. Uh, it looks very much like a, a horror scene. Queen Tlalamba, what an amazing cat everybody, sure, and that's a lovely little video that you all got to see there to show you more about one of the characters that we have here, Gemma, one of the leopards, I was with her yesterday morning and on the move she was, <laughs> we uh, um, Aubrey found tracks, uh, one of the guides from, from Juma and um, yeah he found tracks and they were going this way then there was another vehicle circling that side anyway she was on the move territorial patrol so I know all about the fact that she moves so much and then eventually we caught up with her beautifully in that tree yesterday which was stunning so I did get to spend a little bit of time with her and then of course Panda and Cedric had her last night so she moved from where we had her in the morning I think she rested in the day in that drainage line that I was talking about behind that big tree and then um, yeah Panda and Cedric bumped into her last minute leopard last night which was very very cool and um, there were some more tracks of her this morning I believe somewhere along the line up near where they saw her which makes sense if she carried on down the road or something like that um, so yeah it would be lovely to find her again but uh, as mentioned she does move a lot and if she is pregnant like I say I the way she was sitting yesterday oh my word the way like she sat up or like she was sitting in a chair in the tree that was wonderful uh, it did look like that belly <clears throat> it looked like that belly was a little bit round um, so fingers crossed that she is pregnant or going to have cubs very very soon that would be awesome um, Nina it is a very good question and it is one of the things that is amazing about the Sabi Sands is that the leopard density um, arguably one of the highest in the world for such a small area 65,000 hectares um, and you've got sure a lot of leopards males and females in the area um, but it does happen they do clash and you do have um, females bumping into each other males bumping into each other or overlapping their territories actually and uh, when that happens then there can be fights and deadly fights um, if one doesn't move off and it's something that I actually haven't seen myself but it did happen on a reserve that I was working on um, two females came into contact with one another and they fought like it was very dramatic um, and the one was quite badly injured from that fight and had to move off but generally they try and avoid each other because if you think about it the biggest risk often to an animal is the same species of animal they are the ones that can harm them the most so it's really important that is why they scent mark and try and steer clear of one another so that each can have their own territory and then they can avoid conflict which is the ideal situation um, so that is sort of what what they are hoping to do but sometimes that doesn't work sometimes they do clash and that is when um, there can be quite intense fights between leopards and what they adjust to um, Nina just to 
to to fresh that out a little bit more is that they actually have smaller territories in comparison to lower density areas so the less leopards there are in an area the less in the, the 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 bigger their territories can be because there's less competition as that density increases they actually force to have smaller and smaller territories so that um, they can you know they and also the the area here allows for that because of the resources there's a lot more resource available for these leopards um, speaking of leopards I'm now just checking I've just come on coming on to the boundary for any tracks and signs of the leopards from last night but alas nothing at the moment everyone I'm just gonna turn around and go back quickly It might just be a bumpy up under. Experience captivating wildlife documentaries showcasing incredible animal behavior for free by visiting lionmountain.tv or downloading the app accessible on both Apple and Android platforms. Alright, so we're still following up on uh, Tlalamba. Uh, it tracks went directly into Little Gari there at Baboon Pan. Uh, just inside Baboon Pan, or inside Little Gari, and coming back all the way east along this side in Little Gari. So I'm knowing her, she might pop out onto Chitwa and then cut across into Torchwood and back this way. So we are just going to kind of take a look very carefully and all that. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> Some vehicles on uh, rushing to a sighting there. Good luck on them. Hopefully they get some uh, great, uh, or get a great sighting that side. All right, let's see what we can continue doing here. I don't want to miss anything. Here. I'm just scared that she does cross over this main road. And the other guys have missed the tracks. A doodle bug. Yes, so Tlamba does look like uh, Tingana. I think the older she's getting, the more she's looking like a father. 
And it's really got the uh, Tingana's uh, the features there. But as I said, she looks a lot as well like the typical Karula lineage. You know, that's a very short muzzle. That what comes all the way from Karula or from Safari, Karula, Tandi, all oh, that small, short snouts. I just want to quickly get hold of the other guy that's got the tracks inside here, so he's still going to keep me updated. All right, well, we're going to try and see if we can pick up on any other tracks around here for Tlalamba. Let's head over to Amy. Good luck to Cedric. I really hope they do find Talamba, we have come very much to the area where those leopards were last night and we have found a herd of elephants. This is beautiful. Oh, there's quite a few around, all starting their morning. There's a mom and calf quite close to us here on the right, but um, she's just behind a bush, <laughs> so we can't show, you, show her to you right now. But a beautiful morning to begin with some elephants. Absolutely stunning. Oh, I hear a hyena in the background. I'm not sure if you heard or not. Can we show this one? I don't know. Maybe it's a bit, bit too much behind the bushes. There's a little one that's coming very close to us here. Hello. Good morning. It was resting its leg on that bush behind me. Mom's just behind it as well. Good morning, Mama. Oh, Queenie, I'm just as excited as your baby's coming now behind mom. How awesome is this, everyone? Sure, that tree that she's munching on is called a buffalo thorn. It is extremely spiky. That is unbelievable. Wow, look at that, how she used her tongue there. That is so cool. This light is just incredible. She's gonna take some more of that very sharp bush. She's using her foot as well to help break it off. Do you see that? There we go. She has learnt the art of feeding. Wow, in it goes. Oh, and a little scratch of the ear. Just watch the tip of that trunk. Looks like it has a mind of its own, the way she can control things with it. Look at that. Do you see how she does that? And uses her tusk now. Oh, this is a lesson in the art of feeding by a mature female elephant. Another little scratch.
Hmm, Mary Kate, this is generally the fruit um, that an elephant would eat are also in the summertime. As she moves past, she might just give us a bit of a head shake, so that's pretty normal. But she's very relaxed. Um, so things like jackal berries, they might even eat quarry berries. There's an elephant crossing behind us now as well. Um, so generally because fruits all sort of come into season at the same time in summer, there's really not much fruit around in the winter time. But they can vary their diet. So marudas generally are um, fruiting from around December time or so. And then there's also things like figs from a sycamore fig. There's also, like I said, jackalberries, which is another favorite of uh, Ellie's. But because an elephant's diet varies so much, they can make up, they love the fruit when it is summer, but they don't need it. So as summer passes, there's another elephant that's just catching the morning sun there. Oh, beautiful. And they adjust their diet from grass and fruit in the summer to more leaves, bark, roots, that sort of thing in winter time. Sure, this is so cool. <laughs> the little one's playing with a the branch there, but Cursed an elephant tabulous. I haven't heard that one before, actually. Oh, and this little family is now starting to head off. We were so lucky with our timing there to have them right here. Oh, that little one's going to the loo. <laughs> Oops, there we go. Just gonna reverse panda, we can get another view of them. <clears throat> One more. Oh, Metro. I think that's very possible, actually. I mean, just like us sneezing with different pollen, maybe they are also affected as well. There we go. We can get them coming across. Is that branch in your way? Is it good? Okay. Get them coming across this open plain. So I think pollen could definitely have an effect on them, I mean, why not? If it, if it does cause some sort of a little bit of a reaction, maybe they'll sneeze. I wonder if I've seen an elephant sneeze before. Panda, have you seen an elephant sneeze before? I'm also thinking, I don't think, I've seen a giraffe sneeze. irritating me <clears throat> but this little family now is going to be heading off carry on feeding for the day maybe slow their slow they right on the boundary maybe make their way onto the property to the west of us find some water later on as it heats up beautiful to see them catching the first few rays of light from the Sun
Guadalupe, indeed it is so beautiful. What I love about being out here and, and doing this and spending time with these animals in this way is that we really just get a glimpse into their life and we can get so close to them which is amazing. Elaine, that is, you know, it's one of those things where there's definitely, you know, they use the same sounds as such, same um, basic communication tools. But I think there's definitely something unique for each group in terms of they know when the matriarch is talking, whether it's her tone, whether it's, um, yeah, the way that she uses her different sounds, it's definitely recognizable. They know when they are the family's being spoken to by their matriarch so <clears throat> whether that is considered an actual dialect i'm not sure but it is you know each group has I suppose their way of talking to each other and um, it can be recognized by that specific group which is amazing So as we leave these elephants to carry on feeding, you are going to go have a look at a clip about elephant family structure. Elephants have fascinated us for so long because they display the same social complexities and full emotional range of our own human species. Mothers, sisters, cousins and aunts live in herds while the bulls wander the wilderness as bachelors. Cows live in the same herd from birth until the end of their life some 60 years later. The herd is led by the oldest and wisest female, the matriarch. She's not only responsible for leading the herd, but also dishing our discipline to the often unruly teenagers. With their flappy ears, floppy trunks and folded skin, baby elephants have the cuteness edge over their human counterparts. Like toddlers, they are playful, curious and love rolling about in the dirt. Human voices and vehicles provide endless entertainment for bored little elephants, and they, in turn, are always a source of amusement for us. Exploring is the main source of calf entertainment, but it's a scary and sometimes prickly world out there. And mum is thankfully never far off. Bulls become boisterous when they hit puberty, and this irritates the matriarch. Once she's had enough, she will boot them out of the herd to find their own way in the world. Like playground bullies, the young males fight for dominance, sometimes with extreme violence. The older bulls live alone but mentor these young bucks. 
It is these fellows that are the ultimate gentlemen of the wilderness. All right, so just got a nice male kudu here. Oh, don't go, don't go. Oh, but look at those ones. We're going to see if we can get it. Unfortunately, this light is going to be a little bit bad, but a beautiful male kudu that's just feeding now behind one of those bush willows. And there's a female coming out there. So a female to the left. And this beautiful male. Look at those horns now. Ah, coming to the light. No. Okay, we might get him now. A nice kudu bull that's following a, a kudu cow. Look at that. Yo! That is now quite impressive. That, those are beautiful horns. He might be in heat, that's why he's just following him. All right, there they go. All right, it looks like they've just gone further into the into the bush and out of a sight. That was nice, nice uh, kudus for the morning so far. All right, so update as well for the tracks of Columba coming past uh, Treehouse Dam, went straight south, Gauri Main, Little Gauri, and uh, she has not popped out onto Juma as of yet. No tracks coming onto Juma, no tracks going into Chitwa. So I think she. Experience captivating wildlife documentaries showcasing incredible animal behavior for free by visiting lionmountain.tv or downloading the app accessible on both Apple and Android platforms. Maybe not really. No, but where will the? How would they actually find out if that leopard is uh, or if that animal is pregnant by just uh, looking at the scat or the dung or feces? All right, slowly now coming to the northeastern corner of. Uh, of Jimmy, yeah. I'm just gonna take a look around this side just to see if those black tail males didn't come across. Kimberly, my biggest leopard clash I've ever seen. Um, Kim Kimberly, that was sure it was in 2010 uh, where I saw two male leopards, uh, Tyson, a male that was called Tyson or known as Tyson, 
and there was another male known as uh, Mafufunyan. Uh, of course, that's uh, Tandi and uh, Shadow's father. And uh, they had a clash at a dam called Big Dam there on Shirley's Arethusa. And um, that fight was absolutely hectic. You know, the, go the, the, the gold around their neck on their shoulders and all that was not that kind of gold color anymore. It was red. It was, uh, it was soaked in blood, in their own blood. Um, and uh, those two just did not, not one of them became submissive. Both of them were territorial males bumping into each other and it was just, uh, yeah, it was just uh, a, f a huge fight from there on. And it happened and it played out for a long period of time. I think it was about maybe an hour and a half, hour, hour and a half of these two males just fighting and then resting, fighting and then resting, sizing each other, fighting and then resting. And uh, phew, yeah. It was, uh, you know, I felt so. You could actually hear the popping noises with their claws going into each other's coats and on the necks. You can actually hear it. It's like, it sounds like, you know, with bubble wrap. You can actually hear the claws going into their coat, into their skin. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was my worst, uh, worst one I've seen, you know. Uh, let me give another one now. There in the west, not long ago as well, that uh, there was those two males that side, <coughs> Tamba and uh, Ravenscourt. Oh, all right, thank you so much, uh, Jared. Okay, so. They can test if uh, the animal or the female is uh, pregnant by testing the scat and in the blood, and the blood itself. All right, well, they do that at zoos. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ah, you learn something new every single day. All right. Well, we'll have to try and look for Columbus scat now, eh? <laughs> we gotta get one of those little testing jars. <clears throat> no, I don't think it's that simple. I think you need the right equipment and uh, the right formula. I'm poor, yeah. I'm <laughs> important enough to pick it up. No, you can't, yeah, picking up scat with bare hands, not a good thing. Not a good, especially our predators, scat. Gloves. All right, slowly coming up to the dam here, Bifflesuk Dam. I'm going to sit here for a little bit. I might uh, pop my nose in there at uh, my ribs. Might go and pop my nose in there very soon, but uh, let's first go and see what's happening around the dam area. Maybe get some elephants coming down here, maybe some buffaloes. We haven't had buffaloes for quite some time. Paul, since you've been back, have you seen buffaloes? Nothing, eh? No. Uh, buffaloes, but they should be coming sooner, you know, sooner or later, they should be coming into these areas. You know, winter time we get quite busy with buffaloes, so I'm hoping that. Uh, that starts changing up a bit and we start getting those big herds coming through. That'll be very, very nice. Always love watching buffaloes coming down to water holes, you know, to these dams for a drink. Elizabeth, ah, thanks. Oh, what, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's, when you think about leopards, and especially when you enjoy it so much, you've got such a huge passion for, you know, all animals, and especially for the leopards for myself now, talking for myself, and, uh, you know, you always got to, you, you know, you want to kind of keep up on uh, who's been here, what, your, what kind of sightings you've had over your time, and, uh, you know, it's just, yeah, it's the same as, like, say, for instance, uh, a racing car driver, you know, you want, you, you know, racing for many years and i'm sure you'll remember his favorite races and who he raced against and all that so oh, okay this light is going to be very sharp very very sharp 
Um, <laughs> Paul, you're not going <laughs> to... <laughs> this light is so sharp, it's bouncing off the dam, off the water. Sorry, I have to um, make a plan here. Let's see if we can maybe turn around. No, that's even going to be worse, huh? Oh, we can. Oh, there's a hit, but yeah. We can try and see if we can get this side. Sorry, it's just going to be not good for our eyes at all. And I can imagine him poor. He's going to have arc eyes after this. So, I'm just going to try and pop here. Like this. I think this will be the best for now. Yeah. All right, so we got the Biffles Hook Dam. Beautiful, the water's like a mirror this morning. Not a breath of wind, yeah. All right, as you can see, there's got the one hippo still, yeah? It looks like the rest of the pod has moved on to other dams. There's nothing at Biffles Hook, I mean, Gary Dam. That's one of the dams that's just to the east of our camp. I think maybe the rest of the pod might have ended up going further north from Juma into Biffles Hook. And so there is another two, one or two big dams in that area. So uh, less stress for them all being at one place. Fancy playing safari snaps? Or showing off your photo skills in fun competitions? How about sneak peeks of our brand new camera spots and live chats with fellow Africam fans? Well, Africam All Access has got your back. Just head to Africam's YouTube channel, hit the join button and select Africam All Access. You'll unlock Africam premium website perks and all the VIP benefits of our YouTube memberships. Well, it has flown, but it is it's still flying about us, yeah, above. You can hear it calling. Ah, uh, off it goes. Sorry, everybody. We had a brown-headed parrot there for a brief moment. Actually, longer than what I expected. Sometimes we, um, we don't have them at all. At least we could show you the parrot there. But a beautiful scene, and the birds are starting to call and wake up.
Yeah, black-headed oriole in the background. There's an emerald spotted wood dove. Very peaceful here as we approach this waterhole. Don't see any other birds right now. But I think let's go closer to the water and then we'll see if there's something else that we can show you all. Definitely some leopard tracks heading up this road. Um, but not super fresh. I think it might have been Salamba from last night. It makes sense. This is she was found just over there um, earlier in the day when I had her, and then um, Cedric had her last night. So I think she made her way up the side, and then that is where those tracks are coming from last night. It's a little bit bumpy here everybody, so just hang on. Oh, I see a pied kingfisher. Oh, it's a pleasure. There's a pied kingfisher hunting. At the moment they just landed on top of the log and then it was hovering and hopping into the water. The bush keeps on teaching us there's always something to learn. I'm glad that you can learn but also even us out here the more we observe the more we watch these animals the more we research things the more we find out which is also there we go it's hovering again let's see if it's gonna catch something. I have to check with my binoculars if it is successful. Not yet. I think it's actually putting out its wings to dry off there now. A little bit of sunshine helping to dry off those wings from the water. I love kingfishers. They are such awesome birds. There's such variety amongst that group. <laughs> there we go, it's hunting again. Nice work, Panda. This kingfisher is on the hunt this morning. Oh, it's just gone behind the bush. It might come out again, so just bear with us. There we go. All right, everyone, we are going to carry on see if this kingfisher uh, catches a fish this morning. And let's send you over to see. Came back here to my rips, as you can see. He's uh, moving nicely, not uh, too bad at all. And he's just going, he's just moving around here. On the one side of the bank and looks like he's well now we've just got his little tail showing out so we just i just came in here just to see how he's doing and yeah he looks very perfect as you got here he's lying down just watching catching flies doing his normal thing this young male leopard and now uh, he's gone all right done <laughs> <laughs> uh but still at the same area it looks like he did bring 
uh, that impala down. Um, all right, let's just go. I'm going to try and go around like that. Oh, here he comes out again. Don't worry. Hey, my boy. Yes, you're looking good. You can see. You can see that, of course, the left hand side there is still open due to, as I said, they. Oh, okay, coming to you. I'm just going to take my foot off the pedal there. The left hand side is still open, and why that? Uh, why the vet uh, left uh, the left hand side still like? An, well, she didn't stitch the left hand side. Is just to give him that that nice little bit of mobility, to when he climbs a tree, and when he comes down a tree, and you know just to do a few things. And luckily, it's not as deep as where it was on the right hand side. So that right hand side is completely stitched up, um, the same as all the way down to his chest area. So. But yeah, no, he's he's getting there. He's getting there. You know, it's uh, it's not overnight. Uh, he, uh, like I'm gonna say, 100% health. It takes a little bit of time. It's like all of us, even us at home. If you're sick, if you've got an injury, it takes a few days of recovery. Maybe even sometimes a few weeks. So yeah, yeah he wants to rather lie there, hide his face from us. There we go. I'm just, uh, I'm just, uh, just hanging back a bit. I don't want to go and park right there next to him. Yes, Jessica, that fur will grow back. It's going to take time, but the fur will start growing back. So uh, it's going to be interesting. Look, he's always going to have a scar there, no matter what. I mean, it's a, it's a huge scar, a huge wound. So he is going to have a scar. So at the end of the day, you'll always pick up that uh, when you find my rips uh, and you always will see there will be a, a scar from this wound. But it was actually very interesting as well. So um, when the vet shaved his fur off to do, the, of course, the stitching, it's amazing that actually the, the skin itself, not the fur, but the skin itself has got the rosettes. So, so even if you shave a leopard completely, even if you kind of shave uh, all the fur off, uh, off, off a, a, a leopard, you'll still see the rosettes on the skin. So it won't be just like a bare skin, it'll still have rosettes on it. So it's quite interesting to see that. All right, I might just go park there. Uh, sorry, Paul, I do apologize. I know that you, I do. All right, all right sorry. <laughs> I'm just thinking, just gonna pop my nose in there. So at least we... Virginia, yes, no, he's looking, he's looking good. You can see what he's doing now. He's just busy making his wound. Always very important. I think, you know, like dogs and cats, a lot of healing agents in their saliva. So by licking your wound and all that, it's just keeping the wound clean, first of all, and second of all, just to kind of heal up much, much quicker. So I always say licking your wounds. And that's exactly what my lips has done. You can see his belly's still nice and full, so he's still have, he's still been eating as well. Very important. You know, that's the main thing. As long as he's not losing body condition, he's picked up some weight. So the vets told us as well. So his weight is between 51 to 55 kilograms at the moment. I said 51 when uh, James and Steve was with him, and after eating and you know getting a little bit of uh, weight, gaining weight, he said I think they. He's put on at least maybe a good two or three kgs on top of that, and uh, which is very good. Anna Marie, you most welcome. Yes, I mean this is uh, you know this is for all of us uh, a very important uh, a character, a very important animal. Oh, well, all the animals are important, but you know just uh, been following him for such a long time, and uh, you know, I'm glad that uh, you know from seeing him the first time to seeing him now, you know, or well, the first time with the wound and seeing him now with uh, the wound that's been closed up. Um, you know, it's at least. 
a lot of positivity there, showing that he is getting better. There we go. You can see now, look, in the, look how nicely that wound has been sewed up there. See on the, now that's where the deep side was. That's where the cut was deep in, into his uh, tissue, into his muscle. A little bit itchy, of course. You know, like when you've got a cut and all that, it's always going to be itchy, no matter what. Well, Earth Week is uh, coming up now from the 22nd of April is uh, Earth Day and we are cele celebrating with uh, Earth Week. Uh, this year's theme is going to be Planet versus Plastics. From the 22nd of April until the 28th of April. April. Uh, we will play out one stunning insert per day of Earth Week. And of course, from uh, tomorrow, Monday and uh, Tuesday, We'll see us. Uh, you will see us going live for the sunset safari only, not for the sunrise safari, but for the sunset safari. We will go live tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, and Tuesday afternoon. Hey, my boy. Yes. It must be so itchy. Oh, boy, you getting there? You getting it? You're a strong cat. Oh, don't don't scratch it. Ah, it looks so sore when they scratch it. We are in the prime seat for watching this kingfisher preening itself. This is absolutely fascinating. How awesome is this panda? Hey, this is incredible.
what it's doing everyone is it's getting oil from its preening gland it's applying it to its feathers with its beak it's shaking its feathers out realigning everything to make it perfect again it's done a lot of hunting this morning a lot of diving down into the water trying to catch some fish and every time it does that it sort of affects its feather feather alignment and also adds moisture to its feathers so it's trying to get itself nice and waterproof again so that it can carry on feeding hunting also using its feet to scratch Jerome no, so this isn't the largest kingfisher. There's actually a kingfisher called a giant kingfisher. I haven't seen one on Juma before, but you do get it in the Sabi Sand area. They like big rivers, more the Sabi or the Sand River that runs through the property. Um, but it's not it's not the biggest kingfisher in the area. It's actually this one, the brown hooded kingfisher, they're all about the same size. The largest being, I'd probably say triple the size of this kingfisher, the giant kingfisher. What I will do is once we are finished with this, well once this pied kingfisher is finished doing its grooming, I'll actually show you in the book what the giant uh, kingfisher looks like. Terry knows so the pied kingfisher is uh, exclusively hunting in water not to say they're never gonna take a uh, some sort of oh all right head over to Cedric all right uh, just thought uh, exactly what I thought he was coming down for a drink here at uh, Bifuzuk Dam so Marip sisters decided to come for a nice refreshment this morning what you're going to do once he's finished drinking I'm sure he's going to head back to where the kill is and uh, we'll let him be at least we've got a nice little view of him for the morning just to see if he's all good and well Lenny, so how do we, how do they get the impalas up in the tree for them? They chase them up there. No, no joking, Lenny. I'm not too sure. I think they just uh, hoisted up there somehow. Oh, I'm gonna go to drink there. Let me just go a little bit forward. Huh? 
for me than now when you've got a pump all day. I don't want to fall down here. Yeah? Yeah. I think that's the furthest I can get. I'll go any further. We're going to be joining the big crocodile here in the dam. I'm sure they're just linear. I'm sure they like somehow grab this. If not just one person, I mean, there'll be like five, six, seven people that'll grab the impala and try and hoist it with a rope or something, pull it from one side, put it into the tree. Michelle, the, the croc, but I, I'm sure, you know, one thing, I'm sure this, uh, he's luckily he's in a little puddle far from the main water. Usually a leopard will lie, they kind of lie on their chest when they drink, but you can just see it's a little bit sore around the chest area, so clearly he doesn't want to lie straight on top of these, on top of the wound, so he'll rather just kind of still stand and drink. All right, so we're going to let him be, let him go and do his thing and all that, and uh, at least we got a, a nice little update about him now. I just want to see where is he going now. In two magical African wilderness areas, the Masai Mara in Kenya, the Great Kugu National Park in South Africa, five expert safari guides follow a cast of compelling animal characters and the never-ending stories that define their lives. The Cat Report documents real stories of real predators, as witnessed and captured by a band of obsessive wildlife filmmakers. <laughs>
I was just saying how I wonder if it is going to start hunting again, hovering and dropping down into the water. But just look how sharp that beak is at the tip. Wow. I think that must be like a knife, like a razor blade at the end there. And I'll use that to stab through the fish to catch it. Still a few feathers that need to be put into place. It has been sitting there. Oh, it's puffing out a little bit. <laughs> Even yes, absolutely, it is being very thorough. Really, it's making sure that it's basically perfect again in order to carry on with its flying and and diving down into the water. Oh, and there we go. <laughs> oh, it just actually landed behind the bush there. Um, well. This is a good opportunity for me to show you in the book. I don't know what the lighting is going to be like. Is that okay, Panda? So here in my bird book, you can actually, I can actually show, let me hold it like this. So here we have the Pied Kingfisher. That's the one we've been looking at here. And then just next to it is the Giant Kingfisher, which is the largest that we get here. So those are the two, the difference. Um, the giant kingfisher is about 44 centimeters in in size whereas the pied kingfisher is only 25 so it's uh, just about half half the size of a giant kingfisher but they the giant kingfishers look a lot bigger as well because of the feathers and that sort of thing but um yes in comparison it's a, a lot larger so those are the two the two that i was speaking of and then the other sort of ones that we get around the water are higher up on the page here. The Malachite Kingfisher, very, very beautiful bird. The half collared, a lot rarer to find. I've seen around the Sabi River before. And um, yes, yeah, so those are, those are the main ones. Um, and then Pygmy up in the corner. You can see the color between these three is very similar, but their habitats are quite different. So African pygmy is more inland. You won't really find around the water. When malachite, you'll find around the water. And then half collared is a lot rarer, um, also around the water, but looks quite different to, to the malachite if you do happen to see them in person. Okay, so those are some of the kingfishers that we find. Yeah, I see it is hunting again. It's flying. It might come back up to this perch, panda. There we go. And I mean, no, actually, I saw a woodland kingfisher the day before yesterday, but they they are far less around, and also they're not calling at all. So there are still a few that haven't left yet, but it will be very soon now that they will all be gone. I would say usually the latest I've seen one in the past is like the first week of May um, but they are they are starting to move and and leave and head back up um, more north into Africa
<laughs> yes, Elizabeth, I've noticed that as well. These little tails flicking almost every three or four seconds. And I've done a bit of reading as to that, that sort of tail flicking. It, it happens a lot in bee eaters as well. It does have some more to do with, um, you know, counterbalancing when they perch like that. The tail, of course, does help. But that little flick is, I guess, associated with, with I want to say happiness, like we would experience happiness as humans, but um, just sort of, you know, content doing its thing little flick of the tail it's almost don't it was almost happens absent-mindedly I think for them almost like a dog wagging its tail <laughs> it's coming back I really wanted to catch something now. I feel like it's really trying hard. Oh, Amazon, that must have been amazing for you to see your first giant kingfisher. Lovely. Well, we are now offering you all a YouTube membership program and there are some great benefits to joining and the best one being that you get to view all our content ad free uh, as well as being able to rewind and pause as you are watching. You can go to our YouTube channel to find out more and click join. Uh, it's a really simple process and if you are on DSTV, uh, please consider coming across to YouTube for an ad-free experience at a fraction of the cost. All relatively new smart TVs have the YouTube app and you should be able to join and set it up quite easily and still be able to view all our content without any ads. Alright, well, I think our time is going to be ending soon with this kingfisher we're going to carry on and see what else we can find but while we do that you are going to watch a clip of other magical moments at a waterhole Waterholes are nature's gathering points for friend and foe. Families and friends converge and reunite. Others seek relief from the midday heat. Thank you. 
Some must drink daily. Some get thirsty after a large meal. Murky water can be camouflaged. A source of food. And sometimes, safety. of the dry season, water holes are a source of vital moisture and frequently terror. Whatever the season, water holes provide a sense of peace, wonder, and wilderness entertainment. All right, so we have left uh, Marips, that's a young male leopard, um, after his drink. It looks like he went to go and rest in some shade there. And we just let him be. And we have moved on with our safari. But yes, water holes can be quite uh, amazing. I always believe sitting at water holes, especially when you get to these dry times, winter time. Mm, like from now on, start heading to water holes, start sitting around at uh, you know little pans and dams the rivers it's amazing what you can actually see there if you sit there for quite some time grab your binoculars and then just start scanning the area you know, all different birds and insects mammals coming through i love love waterfalls oh water is life you know, water is a necessity. All right, slowly they're coming now. I think talking about water holes, uh, I'm going to go slowly or hit slowly towards uh, Twin Dams. And then from Twin Dams, as I said yesterday, actually, I want to go and start looking at some of the hyena dens. A lot of hyena tracks are going coming down and up from Philemon's cut line to, towards Taxon to some of those den sites. So I am going to go and uh, take a look there and start, uh, yeah, start investigating. Just now we've got a hyena den here somewhere and we don't even know about it. I miss a lot of those hyena characters. I think also the dynamics of our hyenas here over the last year has also changed a lot. Brenda, yeah, wild dogs. Yo, when, I don't know who saw wild dogs last. Was, did you see any wild dogs? Let's go back. Um, I think it was James. It was somebody. I think it was James or Steve. One of them that uh, had some wild dogs. Well, I was on leave. Ah, so James on the 13th, 13th of April. All right, there he is. That's actually quite, uh, quite some time ago. Sorry, I just sort of some tracks here. I just want to double check here. Oh, male leopard tracks going straight up. Fresh male leopard tracks. Hmm. I'm not, f yeah, no, there's bird tracks all over it. Okay, that's not that fresh, sorry. And because of the soft sand, sometimes a, a track can look very fresh when the sand is nice and soft. It holds that, uh, 
Well, that's shape for a few days. But as soon as you see squirrel and mongoose tracks and bird tracks on top of the leopard tracks, and you know that nothing too fresh. Annabelle, yes. No, uh, my lips did seem very aware of me this morning. That's why I uh, just felt like keeping the distance there, watching him drink and rather move off, um, you know. You know, but that's typical. You can understand. Well, all of a sudden he's been darted a few times already over the last uh, week or so because of that injury, that wound that he's had on, the, that he's had on his neck due to the snare. And uh, so he's not a happy cat. I mean, who's going to be happy for, you know, after having this kind of ordeal in the last week? No one's going to be happy. You know, you're not going to be full of beans and jumping around and like playing with little butterflies. No, you're not, you're not you're sore, you're miserable, you're trying to heal. So, yeah, not, not, a, not a happy cat. You'll see, once he starts feeling better, once the, the wound closes up, and then he'll get to that nice little, kind of a, more of a relaxing stage again. So now we just rather do a quick view on him, make sure he's still good, and then leave. Respect his space, his time. Sorry, I don't want to jump off here. Look, I've got some cat tracks on the road here. So I want to double check here. I know, it's hyena tracks. My apologies. This is hyena tracks that's coming up on the road. I just saw some something that was on top of the vehicle tracks. Yeah, but that's the hyena tracks. All right, let's continue. Cedric's probably going to fall that one.
Gavin, so when it comes to vultures, their whole head actually and their neck, there are little feathers there, but they 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 very very small. They're not really thick at all, and it gives them almost like a naked head look. Um, and that has to do with their adaptation to eat carcasses. So that head is quite bare. They've got quite a long neck so that they can stick it in. They don't have to worry about feathers getting stuck and that sort of thing. Um, and it just makes it easier for them to, to eat off carcasses and scavenge. Um, and they come in and they're able to, to put their heads between bones and skin and meat and 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 blood and that sort of stuff um, and then it's it's quite easy for them to then go to a water hole and, and clean themselves off All vultures will have that very similar look and shape to them. The white back is the most common that we see out here, well the most regularly. Hooded is another and then even the lappet face and the white headed other species of vulture, they all have that general look, sort of the, their wings come up by their heads and then they have sort of a bare head look because of that very reason, because they eat off carcasses and as I said they won't be here all day <laughs> once the Sun is and is already starting to warm up I think it's time just about time for me to take off my jacket and um, then they'll start flying, soaring in the sky, being on the lookout for something to eat. <laughs> Paul, it's it's true. They don't have the neatest nets, nests. In fact, many birds of prey and vultures um, have messy-looking nests. And I think. Because they're such big birds, they tend to carry bigger sticks and twigs and things like that to make their nests with. And just because of what they use, the nesting material they use, they can't get it to look very neat. Um, things like weavers or little passerine birds, uh, your songbirds make such cute little neat nests uh, because they are petite birds. They're able to be more precise and, and uh, delicate with their nesting material and nest building whereas these bigger birds use sort of dead twigs and things like that um, to make their nests and so it does look quite messy I mean, some vultures, so, so vultures are often in pairs, um, they do have mating pairs, no matter the species you'll, you'll sometimes find males and females together, um, and no, sometimes they can, they look, 
I find myself, well, white back vultures and hooded vultures for me are a lot more common in the area. Um, and so we tend to find more of them grouped together, especially around carcasses or when they're soaring. And then your white-headed and lappet-faced are the ones that I see more singly of. Um, so I would say just based off of, of observation, the white-backed and the hooded tend to flock more, if you want to put it that way. And the white-headed and the lappet face seem to be found more solitary on their own. Yeah, an emerald spotted wood dove in the background. <laughs> they are underrated birds. They are so vital to the ecosystem out here. They do have a bit of a bad reputation and very misunderstood, I think. Um, just because of the association with death carcasses things that you know no one really likes so much and then they also get grouped in with you know the the things of of associated with death and that sort of stuff but it's it's I mean that is true of course but that is the adaptation that is how they found a niche in this ecosystem to be able to survive and they provide and and play such a pivotal role in what happens out here and vultures are so endangered and so um, some of them even critically endangered because of the misconceptions about them and them being poached or poisoned But I'm glad in, our, in the conservation areas that there are around the world for vultures that there are being efforts made to help preserve them, educate people on their role and that they, there's nothing magical or superstitious about them, they're just birds like any other bird. We have an exciting announcement. Wild Earth is launching a YouTube membership program. For a nominal monthly fee, members get an ad-free channel, prioritized questions, early access to videos, and many more perks. You'll get fun features like badges and emojis that'll make you stand out in the chat. YouTube memberships will help us to continue with our mission of connecting people with nature while giving you access to lots of our amazing content.
let's see if we can find if we can find those kudus and we know where they're calling from you know that's the main thing uh, and, if a, and if a kudu is alarm calling then you know that they are seeing something it's not like just a how can i say a false false alarm call it's usually with kudus bushbuck nyala monkeys they usually always tend to when they alarm call they tend to be well they, they make sure about what they're seeing and like in parlors and that especially in parlors squirrels and franklins they'll alarm call for anything even for a little slender mongoose that's running around oh yeah yeah our tracks go right here <laughs> <laughs> Columbus tracks go right here. So she came all the way back onto this side. So she, and I know this morning I didn't get any tracks there. So she hasn't crossed over here. The tracks are here. Very fresh tracks. Okay, she's cut straight across. She's cut across. Remember last time we found them, Paul? Remember we went around. Let's go look there. Linda, you say that lime call got your dog's attention. <laughs> See, they know exactly. They know exactly. Mmm. That was a smelt, eh? Smelt uh, leopard there. A smelly, smelly. Alright, we might be very close. We might be very, very close. Oh, I think she's cut there. But let's go around. Let's go around. Oh, all righty then. No, Brian. Um, I saw Tulama's mom, Tandi. She, I mean, she was a she was a small leopardess compared to like if you saw Tiani yesterday. I think Tulama was she was small, but uh, she brought down a, a full-grown female kudu. Full-grown female kudu. Yep. True story on Chitwa new driveway. I saw it that side and uh, she brought it down. So maybe a big male kudu. Oh, uh, I think it'll be quite an interesting uh, take down that. You can imagine a nice big male leopard like tortoise pan or more whitey. If one of those leopards have to go for a big male kudu, oh, I can imagine that must be a sighting to to really witness. Of yeah. But it is possible. They're powerful cats. Very powerful cats. All right. And pork. Are we going to get this one now? Somewhere this side. She come across here. She would come here. Come on. Well, she must be lying in a nice marula tree for us. That's where she must be waiting for us somewhere. Saw something there. there. She would have cut across. So sometimes, unfortunately, this road here is very hard, very, very hard. So if she cuts, you know, sometimes Lama doesn't like to use a road, and she cuts straight across. You won't even. Oh, that's a big uh, animal. It's a giraffe. Hello. A nice big male giraffe. You can see walking. And the light is a little bit bad at the moment. And he's going to go and hide behind there. Wow. Oh, you can still see his head. Still looking. If he's looking now that way. Hey? Beautiful male. Jesse, yes, I'm gonna go a little bit forward. The light is so bad. Sorry, I do apologize. The sun is on a bad, bad spot there. And uh, Paul's, I don't want to, Paul's hurting his eyes there. So, um, Paul, I'll just try and go around here yeah, and see if we can get a better, a better position. I 
Better that way? Yeah. A little bit better. There you go, hey, mister. i got a nice ox pecker right on top of his ossicones. Oh, and look, at that's one thing about uh, the advantage of being so tall and eating leaves is that you can reach to little certain spots here on these tall trees and feed on all the nice young little leaves that's coming through. He's looking at something. Let lumbers come past here. Uh, standing by. Oh, sorry, I thought somebody was calling me. But you can see, not even looking at us, looking away. He's a stunning, stunning male, all by himself here. Fully grown. At least five and a half meters up. Oh, he's going to go behind. Mm, he's going to come out there. No, he's going to go a little bit further into the thick, thick stuff. All right, uh, let's uh, let's move on. That was nice. Nice to see a, a giraffe. Yeah, he's going further in there. Oh yes, Betty, for sure. Remember that time we found Mawati? Uh, he helped us. It wasn't long, wasn't long ago. It was what, about a month ago, remember? Yeah. Yeah, on on Vubu Road. And uh, we were sitting with uh, a giraffe. And next moment, uh, he was looking like seriously into onto one spot. And then we knew there was something there. And boom, there was a male leopard, Mawati, popped out there for us. And not once, that's happened a few times. Lions, uh, leopard, uh, they will help us on that. They will help us. They don't make alarm calls, so they don't do like impalas and kudus and all that. They will just kind of, yes, yeah, kudus. Talking about kudus, he has kudus right here. <laughs> All right, so yeah, is the a male and a female kudu? So now, I wonder if it's not these two that were actually alarm calling a little bit earlier. Very, very possible. And you can see the male looking straight to the left there. But, oh, he's got beautiful horns. Female moving off. I'm sure this male is going to follow her. She might be in heat at the moment. So, you'll see he's going to stop feeding. Yep, yep, and he's going to follow suit. All right, well, we're going to sit here or we're going to try and just scan this area, see if we can pick up on uh, that leopardess. Let's head over to Amy as she's doing some birding. That is the dream. Well, everyone, we've come around the corner and we have found some African green pigeons perched in the tree. There were three of them. The one just flew away, but luckily there are still two that we can see. And these birds are quite tricky to find. They are usually high up in the canopies of trees like sycamore figs. Very, very tricky to spot them because they, are, of course, are green in green trees. But they do like to roost in more open trees like this. I've seen it countless times in the e late evening, uh, then sitting on trees like this uh, dead knobthorn. And now in the early morning, just before they head off and start foraging for the day, we are catching the last two here. So they may very f well fly off while we're sitting here with them. But what I love about the African green pigeon is how beautiful they are in color so unique in compared to other pigeons and doves that we find you can see they've got bright orange feet they've actually got a, a bluish oh there we go <laughs> i thought that may happen but we did get to show them to you all which is lovely
and they've got some beautiful colors on them of course being green bird they've got a little like purplish patch on their shoulder as well which makes them very attractive Alrighty, well, we are going to carry on bumbling down this road, heading towards a waterhole. See what else we can find. That was lovely. My sunglasses on as I turn around, the sun's right in my face, so just uh, bear with me, everybody. I'm glad that Cedric found a giraffe, that's very cool. I was saying I was hoping to see a giraffe this morning, so I'm glad he found one. But it has been a lovely morning of doing some birding with Panda. We've enjoyed it a lot so far. It's a good morning for birds of prey and things like that to be perched out before they take off. So I am looking at the tops of the dead trees just like with those pigeons and the vultures. Oh, Ian, yes, definitely. There are still so many birds to see, even if you're not going to have quite that huge variety with all the migrants that come through in summer um, you can still do plenty of birding in the winter it is not as um, let me say uh, busy with birds because it is a little bit cooler there's less food around uh, but the birds are still here calling you can still get between 70 to 100 different species um, in one day of birding in the winter time uh, in the summer you can stretch that up to about 120 or so um, you know if you're really really uh, looking hard <clears throat> birding for me you're probably maybe asking someone who's slightly biased <laughs> But I do, I do love birding any time of the year. I'm just in a bit of a thicker area, so I just want to check. There's some mouse birds flying. Seems like everyone's waking up here now, all these birds. Lots of birds calling around us. Can hear greenback camaropteras as well. It sounds like two little stones clicking together. But birding any time of year, of course, the summer being the ideal, um, basically up until the end of March. Ooh, Jennifer, that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, for the most part, birds of prey stay away from each other, but I definitely do, you know, because they, they're competing and also they can hurt each other. Um, so that is why they sometimes do stay away from one another. While we chat more about that, but I think let's just, we can look at the water here while we talk about birds of prey. Uh, we've arrived here at Twin Dams. It's always good to have a little scan around when you arrive at a waterhole. Um, but Jennifer, I've seen birds of prey clash. They they definitely sometimes actually um, try and steal each other kill other each other's kills. I've seen an African hawk eagle and a tawny eagle. An um, African hawk eagle was actually caught a Franklin, had it up in the air, and the tawny eagle came. The, the, the hawk eagle dropped the Franklin, and the tawny eagle took it up from the ground and took it away. Osprey and African fish eagles both hunt and, and sort of their habitats are around water, both of them, and often they will also fight over territory. So I guess for the most part, birds of prey, just like I suppose leopards or lions or things like that, try and avoid each other. But um, up in the sky and with the, the habitats and different places, they, there's bound to be overlap. And so um, I don't think they actively seek each other out. But if there is a situation where they both meet, they do fight.
can hear some virtual starlings in the background. On the 30th of April, Wild Earth will be coming off the DSTV platform. We want you to come with us into a more sustainable future. How, you might ask? Well, YouTube is a brilliant way for you to enjoy the live drives. Come to our channel and you can enjoy the live drives for free. Alternatively, join our membership program and you'll get an assortment of other wonderful perks. We'll see you on YouTube. just ahead of us and some virtual snarlings <clears throat> So just taking this chance to have a scan around the water. Last time we spotted a water monitor lizard. Oh Ricky, I'm so glad it is Sunday of course today and I hope everyone's enjoying an easy Sunday morning. And hopefully you all will join us again this afternoon to end off your Sundays. Unless of course this is the end of your Sunday depending where you are in the world. quiet this morning I must say everywhere has been like everything's just taken a bit of a reset which is lovely 
to see what the afternoon holds. No, the morning's not finished yet. It can change very quickly out here. That's what makes it all so exciting. All right, well, I think we are also going to slowly make our way around this water hole. And while we do that, you are going to head over to Cedric, who's on the move. Ooh, all right. So, sorry, the bird's got a fright in. And look here, yeah. see, yeah, Columba, is, she can move. So she's gone all the way, Ledwood Road. She came from there, from from where was we find her quarantine she went three hours down three hours little guy little gary all the way around coming back north again and yeah you can see her tracks here coming up right on the top here heading straight up this way sure now she is on the move all right let's get going <sighs> Columba can move. She knows how to. She knows how to cover distance. This female, this female uh, leopardess. She knows how to cover distance. Huh. Unfortunately, I don't. I'm not too sure how far we are behind her. Uh, maybe. Oh, I never know. I'm just hoping she's going to be lying up in a tree uh, waiting for us somewhere, which would be very nice. This would be very nice of her. But yeah, let's let's see, let's see, let's see. Yeah, you know, some leopards uh, specialize in certain things. Not all the time, you know. They are they're opportunistic, so they're going to still try for anything. But there were some leopards that used to, especially some of the males, they enjoyed specializing in like one or two males used to specialize in warthog. Some of them specialized in art fork. So, yeah, so I think Impala is just a general one. There's no, none of them specialize in, uh, although, or actually not none of them, all of them specialize in Impalas um, because it's such a common antelope and common prey species for most of the predators. But, you know, when it comes to warthogs, water termite mounds and all that, I think uh, that's where they will try and specialize in, you know, like the warthogs or the art fox and that. There was a male called the Torchwood male. It was uh, one of Inkanyeni. Inkanyeni used to be a leopardess, yeah, that used to roam around in Torchwood and inside um, in Koro and those areas. And Inkanyeni's son, uh, known as the Torchwood male, when he went uh, to the west, he went straight all the way to the western Sabi Sands and then he, special, he, he specialized in, um, in porcupine. All right, now I've lost the tracks. See, now this is a problem. I've lost the tracks now. So he specialized in porcupine. And exactly, and I saw him catching a few porcupines in the west. Mm, sorry, I've just lost, lost the tracks here now, which is not good. I don't know if she's turned off or anything like that. Let me just go uh, Gwari Pan. She might have come across here. Oh, she might have gone down central. Oh, let me just quickly just check here if any tracks have come further up this road here. Nothing coming up here. All right, let's just turn. Let's go down central. She might have turned that way. You're right, in po <laughs> Something biting you on your arm. Let's just look here. Coming down here. The sketchy hasn't moved up that side. Let's just, just double check here. 
Sorry, I'm just trying to fathom out quickly what she wants to do here. Does she want to go further this way or she wants to go that way? Because she came up north. Well, we're gonna just want to see exactly where this leopardess has turned off. I think while we do that, let's go and take a look at a clip on the lives of leopards. The keys to a solitary leopard survival are territory, food, and mating rights. The scent of buttered popcorn marks their territorial boundaries. With its borders secure, the leopard looks to satisfy its hunger. A perfectly adapted predator, the leopard uses its camouflage to capitalize on its immediate habitat. Superb eyes detect the slightest of movement. Sensitive ears discern the softest footfall. Dagger canines throttle prey while razor claws tear and grip. Powerful shoulders and neck muscles allow leopards to hide their kills in trees away from the other predators. If they can, they'll hoist their kills into the safety of a nearby tree's branches. If a kill is left on the ground, thieves are never far off. But trees are not only a good pantry, they are crucial for safety. Wild dogs, hyenas and lions will kill leopards without a second thought. This spotted cat's climbing skills are vital to its survival and predatory success. It's lovely to look at leopards. We have found, well, not a leopard. <laughs> but we have continued doing our birding this morning and I've come across a beautiful lilac breasted roller just perched here in this knob thorn tree. And the sun is hitting it perfectly in the morning light. And what you can hear calling is just below it, there's a virtual starling. So it's not the roller that's making that noise, but there is a virtual starling just there. Unfortunately, it's a bit in the shade, so you're not getting all that beautiful iridescence like you usually would with a starling. It's a little bit there, but the roller is... Oh, it just flew off. Um, the roller is perched beautifully for us and they often do rollers perch quite for the lilac breasted roller perch quite prominently
have actually heard a starling's mimic before. It's not something that happens very often. I think it was a virtual starling that mimicked. Um, what did I hear it mimicking? Trying to mimic a pearl spotted owl at once. It's not typical behavior for them. Um, but I did once catch a starling trying to trying to mimic another bird. The m usual mimickers are something like a forktail drongo, some of the robins, robin chats that can mimic. And this roller would sort of be sitting here waiting, seeing they eat insects for the most part. Oh, there's a squirrel just ran up this knob thorn as well. And uh, waiting for opportunity for something. Oh, well, I would. Panda, you're amazing. <laughs> there we go. Doing some grooming of its own, this little squirrel. Grooming its paws now. Also waking up, would have woken up maybe an hour or so ago. Also lay in the sun, get nice and warm and now it's going to head out and start foraging for the day. Oh, Batalia is just flying over us. I don't think we're going to be able... Oh, Panda's amazing. He's on it. <laughs> There's a Batalia flying a, f a female, it looks like. Amazing. It is right behind us, so unless Panda's got the neck of an owl. And off it goes. Thanks, Panda. Oh, there comes the second one. Sorry, just to the left. Here comes the male. They often are in pairs, uh, Batalia, Eagle. There we go. So the female flew past and now the male's flying past. So stunning with those orange legs and beak hair. Thanks Panda. I'm not actually sure where the squirrel went to now. <laughs> But the lilac breasted roller is still there. Oh, there goes the squirrel in that open patch. Oh, oh there's, there's a few of them around. All right. Well, Magnus, I suppose so in a way. Um, you know, they eat a lot of sorts of different things similar to that of birds whether it's seeds and fruits and things like that um, maybe an insect or two along the way so in a way they are looking at the same food source um, but they have different adaptations to look for that food in different places I suppose I've never seen a squirrel and a bird fight over food before not to say that it's never happened there's a lot of action around this knobthorn all of a sudden this morning. <laughs> so 
sometimes if you just give the bush a bit of time there's so much to notice Oh, Gemma, me either. They're always beautiful and I think they always need to be given, you know, some recognition for how beautiful they are. everybody well wild earth is turning 17 and cedric and i will be hosting a fireside chat i think it is next week friday if i'm not mistaken and um we are celebrating with you all by looking at the 17 uh, milestones over the last few years and um the 27th of April is the date there for you all um, and we are uh, doing that I think uh, at 7 p.m. and it will be the 17 greatest milestones for Wild Earth so um, join us as we celebrate nearly two decades of bringing the safari to the world and connecting people with nature. Sorry, the 27th is Saturday, not Friday, it's Saturday. Saturday, next week Saturday, is the fireside chat. go this little squirrel's enjoying the sunshine as are we really warming up now for the day <laughs> all right well I think we might carry on bumbling along leave the the squirrel and lilac breasted roller to enjoy the sunshine here at the Snobthorn while we do that you are going to head over to cedric who's doing some birding hey, and uh, yes i've uh, been following up on columbus tracks coming all the way but uh we lost uh, the tracks coming into the block actually funny enough heading uh, back in north maybe towards Biffelzook dam exactly the dam where we are now but how nice is this we've got a gray heron that is uh, <laughs> taking some time out on top of a hippo's back <clears throat> doing some hippo surfing for the morning a nice little structure for the heron just to sit there feel safe as long as the hippo does not go down too deep i think the heron will be happy just lazing on top there and then we've also got a wonderful godzilla number two that is lying on the bank on the left hand side there on a very very hot morning now the morning is heating up perfect and uh, clearly you can see that crocodile has decided to come out and do a little bit of sunning meaning our ectothermic so there he's trying to heat its body up with the sun it's a perfect perfect morning to do that it just came out you can still see it's wet on the back wet on the legs so it just just made its way out onto the bank here now it's a big crocodile and we've been very fortunate having this crocodile here at Biffelzook Dam 
And we've had this crocodile now almost for, whew, what's it now, about a month and a half, I say. And this crocodile arrived, yeah, and uh, been graced by its presence. So it'll lie like that on that bank for quite some time, trying to heat the body up. And once it's nicely heated up, and more energy, more mobility, and it'll all come pretty much back into the water and start looking around for any little bit of food. Maybe it feeds mostly on fish, but if it's got that opportunity to head. This crocodile has caught a baby waterbuck uh, a few weeks ago. It had a baby waterbuck kill. Um, so, I mean, that kill will last the crocodile for a good few weeks or even months. So had a fair amount of food already. Sorry there, uh, Jared. Go with a comment or question there again, please. Oh, <clears throat> oh Anna Marie, if she's moving around so much and if she's had cubs, where would she keep them? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine, Anna Marie. <clears throat> I wish we knew. I wish we knew. You know, I think uh, that's one thing about uh, a female leopard. Once they have cubs and they choose a den site, hmm, to really find that. And it's only, it's up to them when they will actually take us back to the den site and introduce us to the cubs and that. So, you know, we, all, we, we just go with it. We go with the flow. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen now, it doesn't happen now. But if she has to have cubs, it'll be in these drainage lines, these thick areas, a perfect place to hide them. Um, so, yeah, it is, uh, it, as I say, it's, it'll be amazing if she does take us to, to them. But uh, that's if she's had cubs. Difficult to see. I, I, I could see that she last night. She's, got, she's definitely got a milk pouch. You know, you know if you're producing milk, well, you know, you must have young ones, so I don't know. It was difficult to take a look last night. I don't know, yesterday morning Amy had to love her, so I can't see if uh, she actually got a, a proper a, a proper visual on the lumber's bellies, on her teats, just to see if there's suckle marks. Even this old grey heron had a fantastic catch yesterday afternoon. He caught a nice big frog. Or oh, actually, like a, it looked like a plot anna. And it grabbed it from one of the uh, overflow sections, yeah. I think I say using the hippo as a, a little bit of safety, you know, you never, it's right in the middle of the dam. This bird is not going to be surprised by any predator coming close there. And knows it's got the safety of the water around, around it. So it's a perfect little area just to stand and uh, you know, be content with uh, the morning's goings. Clearly not on a on a hunt at the moment. I think it's more just relaxing, enjoying the early morning sun. And the hippos don't mind at all, as you can see. And the hippo did mind that hippo would very, very quickly would have chased that uh, grey heron off its back.
Believe it or not, but there are two vervet monkeys in this tree. They camouflage very, very well in the shadows there. You can just see a bit of movement behind those branches. I think it's mom, mom and, and youngster, not quite baby, but a little one there with mom. Oh, Ellen. I don't know how your family's going to feel about that comment. But um, yes, indeed, monkeys, baboons, they are absolutely fascinating to watch. Out here, they just, you around camp and lodges, they can be an absolute menace. I'm going to pull forward slightly, Panda. They might move though when I start the vehicle. There we go, that might be a bit of a better spot for everyone. There, at least you can see their faces. There's the little one <laughs> scratching his belly. Very interesting that these two monkeys are by themselves. I wonder if the troop is around here somewhere though, just in terms they've all sort of scattered now that the day's begun and they've gone off foraging individually. Down she comes. The baby's following. Um, Josie, no, not that I've ever seen. Um, baboons are a lot bigger and a lot stronger than vervet monkeys, so if I was a vervet monkey, I'd definitely avoid them. There's no real competition in terms of strength and power there. So that would be a little bit silly of a vervet monkey to try and challenge baboons. I mean, there, there are similarities, um, of course, in their behavior and, of course, being related to one another to a degree. But for the most part, they, the vervet monkeys will avoid where baboons are. Looks like they might come out. Just bear with us. They're just in the shadows here of the squirrel bush. Still sort of grabbing some berries. There, that one's hopped up. The guaris are fruiting at the moment. Um, there's tiny little berries that are on the on the trees, which I think is what they're grabbing. Also grabbing some grass seeds. Wow. Eating away there. <laughs> Just having a look to see. Benson, yes, they are omnivorous. Um they can definitely eat meat. Um, it's, I wouldn't say the majority of their diet, but it is possible. All right, everyone, they've now run around, run around on the road. Um, but yeah, meat is definitely an option. Oh, wow, look at that, panda. Oh, saddleboard stalks coming into the dam. I'm going to reverse everyone. 
That's very cool. Oh my word. How lucky are we? I know Sunday and birding don't exactly create uh, um, what do you call it? A, a words that go together, but I feel like Sunday's birding day. <laughs> we just pull forward and we can see this beautiful stalk. Wow. How about that, everyone? Amazing. Jared, that's a good one. Sun, songbird Sunday. Songbird Sunday. What a beautiful animal. I mean, it's just gorgeous. And this, if you have a look at its face, it's got a yellow eye. That means it's the female. Now saddlebird stalks are usually in pairs. This one does seem to be alone at the moment, but perhaps the male is around as well. Ooh, soaring Sunday, that's also a good option. And you can see a bit of iridescence as well on the feathers there, with the sun hitting the black feathers on the back. Oh, how time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Wild Earth is turning 17 and we want to make the years count. 17 years of achievements, close encounters and special memories. He's got it, he's got it and he's straight up a tree. Come along as we reflect on our top 17 greatest moments. Here's to more years of connecting you to nature. Wild Earth, connecting with nature.
crows. <gasps> Is it going to perch on the tree, Panda? Oh, I thought maybe. Wow, that was incredibly special, everyone. It almost just came to say hello and then it left again and we were here for that moment. Brief as it was, it was still very, very special. What a sighting. Well, I think we are going to then carry on now that that saddlebutt stalk has decided to leave. All right, well, as we do that, uh, you are going to head over to Cedric to end off the show. Nice, saddlebutt stalk. That is fantastic. Nice to see that. I wonder if it's not that female again. Was it uh, Joe? Wasn't it a male or female? Do you know? So I know that there's a female that hangs around Twin Dams, Baboon Pan, and goes south to Treehouse Pan in Little Gowrie. Oh, it is a female. Must be the same one then. All right, that's fantastic. Lovely, lovely, lovely. <clears throat> All right. Well, we got some uh, nice uh, male impalas here on the big clearing. You can actually start hearing them early morning, during the night time, during the daytime. A lot of grunting and snorting happening. Males are starting to chase one another around and try and get uh, more, being more dominant than the other one. And that's exactly this time of the year, the rutting season. So of course we're going to try and see who's going to be the most dominant out of these bachelor boys. And then try and place a male that's got a harem somewhere around here on the clearing. And you'll find many times now, this time of the year, uh, leopard kills. If you find a leopard with a kill, most times it'll be with male impalas. Why? It's because uh, when all these ma males are busy sparring and chasing each other around, they're completely oblivious on the surroundings, on predators that's busy stalking them and lurking in the area. And uh, that's when you'll find the leopards and lions, or wild dogs, even our hyenas will take those opportunities to try and grab a male impala that is unaware of that predator. Yes, we're talking about you, mister, in the center. Happy Brit, I'm glad that you enjoyed the sunrise for safari. It was a beautiful morning, oh, weather-wise. I can see a little bit of a, a nice breeze coming through now. You can see the leaves blowing in the background. The grass is swaying around as well. So a bit of a breeze that's coming through. It's cooling the area down a little bit more. But I think it is going to be a scorch of a day. Just telling about all the flies that's hanging around us. But yes, once again, thank you so much for all the comments and questions this morning. And uh, thank you so much for just joining us on our Sunrise Safari. Make sure that you do tune in once again this afternoon at 3 o'clock. is going to be our highlight show on Safari, hosted by Amy. And then we will start our Sun Asset Safari at 3.30. And I'm hoping that we are going to get some amazing sightings again. I'm hoping that uh, all the Queen of Juma at Lumba appears for us somewhere, which would be fantastic. Other than that, maybe some elephants, buffaloes, you never know. You never know. <laughs> yes, but from uh, the Wild Earth uh, team, from Paul and myself, have a wonderful day further. We'll see you this afternoon.